Hi. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Nick Axel and Vizquemas for organizing this event and everybody uh, at BAC for organizing this event and inviting me here to Utrecht. Um, so, as Nick uh, sort of uh, mentioned, I will be discussing our 2016 or 2017 actually uh, Ayotzinapa investigation. And I'm going to take you through sort of uh, the, the process that we worked through in order to achieve this investigation, but also highlight sort of the really unique challenges to uh, this project that actually ended up driving a lot of the end results in sort of uh, fairly surprising ways uh, for, for us. So just a brief uh, introduction to the event itself because it's important to have that sort of background information. Um, on the 26th of September 2014, um, a group of about 100 students left the small town of Tixla in the south. Uh, they were students from a rural normal school. Uh, and they were heading to Mexico City to commemorate uh, the 1968 Tlatelolco student massacre in Mexico City. And what they usually do for this sort of event is they commandeer buses and they, and they go there and they, they go and they demonstrate. And so they drove from their school in a number of buses and they drove all the way up to Iguala, the town in the north, where they intended to um, commandeer another set of buses. But when they arrived in Igua, they were suddenly uh, attacked multiple times uh, in a coordinated way in multiple locations in Iguala by multiple uh, state security forces from multiple branches. And it's important to say that every time these things are, they're multiple, they're not singular. Uh, and they were attacked many times and in a coordinated way and over a period of about an entire night. And then the violence that was perpetrated against the students then spilled out and, uh, and we started being committed against uh, civilians and bystanders uh, and another school bus that had students that were completely unrelated to the incident. I was supposed to show this slide to give you a better idea of where the students were attacked. Um, and after they were attacked, uh, 43 of these students uh, were taken to, well this is according to the official version, they were taken to a dump outside of town where they were killed and burnt. And so they were taken from two different sites within the city in two different buses and taken to uh, this uh, dump called Bade, the Basuero de Cocula. Um, and to this day, uh, the remains of the students and the students have not uh, been found. And so in this context, we were approached by Centro Pro, which is a, a human rights group in Mexico City uh, that represents the families of the victims, and EAAF, so Equipo Argentino de Antropologia Forensis, which is, uh, I don't speak Spanish fluently, but... Um, and they essentially, uh, so sorry, uh, EAAF is important because uh, they uh, were part of an independent group of experts that spent two years essentially analyzing the Basuero de Cocula um, to try to find the remains of the students. But in the process of doing that, realized that their the, the site uh, and the, the forensic details within the site did not match any of the, the, the possibilities that was being presented by the official version and uh, essentially uh, tried to produce a report uh, debunking uh, the site. Um, and uh, when they approached us to do uh, an investigation on this project, we sort of uh, analyzed, you know, we did a bit of background work in terms of uh, getting up to speed on all the information relating to the investigation and to the incident. And immediately there was a, some challenges that became very clear. So the first one, that it was a large, uh, large-scale complex incident. Uh, it wasn't sort of a singular incident that happened in a singular moment in time. It's something that happened over time and over a large geographic area. There seemed to be a, a lack of clarity surrounding the events leading up to the disappearance of the students and a focus on the whereabouts of the disappeared students. So when I say, I say a focus on the whereabouts of the disappeared students, it means that when we're doing research on the case, sort of basic research, looking at news articles and things like that, there was just a lot of focus on where they were and there was very little information about what actually happened 
uh, and what led up, what led to this, uh, to to that sort of final moment. Um, and the media outlets, whether they were sort of pro Mexican, uh, pro government ones, or international media outlets, uh, were often summarizing that lead up to the events uh, by disseminating the official version of the facts, which um, was a, an incomplete version and a contradictory version. And then something that is specific or that was sort of uh, stood out in, in relationship to other forensic uh, architecture projects that you may have seen was the lack of visual material. Because it happened at night, uh, there was a lack of visual material because uh, the, the, the fear uh, in that part of Mexico is so big that people do not uh, instinctively go out and film things with their phones. And this is important because uh, at FA, you know, we are not uh, experts on the general topic, but we do become experts on the actual material that gets presented to us. So we become experts on the images, on the audio files, on the video files, and those become, um, those become sort of our, our, our way into a broader project. Uh, so that was uh, probably the, the most challenging part uh, at, in this early stage of the project. But um, then we came across these uh, two reports um, called the Informe. And these two reports were important because they were produced by the independent group of experts, which were commissioned by the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights. And um, to cut a long story short, when the incident happened, the Mexican government sort of had a, a duty to seem uh, like it was treating this issue legitimately. So they got the, the, the experts involved in order to help them out with the investigation. Uh, the experts produced two reports. In the first one, uh, the, during the, the, the drafting of the first one, the, the experts were trying to help the Mexican government, but then very quickly realized that their version of the facts was deeply flawed. And the report became about highlighting those, uh, those contradictions and those issues, and then by the time they started the second one, they were already getting the sense that they were going to get kicked out of the country. And so they compiled this report and uh, they tried to highlight as much as possible all the issues with the official version and all um, the discrepancies that they came across. Uh, and then we also relied on a few other uh, pieces of information uh, that were provided to us, uh, like reports from the case file, a book uh, written by a journalist who interviewed the victims right after the events. And th the reason why we chose these two reports as a starting point for our investigation was because they had uh, the most exhaustive um, sort of record of the events that happened that night, but also of uh, some of the more general uh, controversies, but also some very sort of esoteric and niche ones. And we got a sense while we were reading these reports, uh, they're each 500 pages, that um, there were details that kept reappearing uh, that we had a, a sense that these details could be spatialized, but because of the format in which they were written, it, it was very hard to actually um, make links between different actors that kept cropping up in different uh, themed chapters throughout. So we set ourselves the task to data mine uh, these two uh, reports. Uh, and data mining is essentially the process of taking a source of information and breaking it down in order to produce a new set of information. And this is sort of my crude uh, example of what data mining looks like is here I have a paragraph and I've sort of color coded it. And basically for every concept, every thought, every action, we try to put it in a row of information in an Excel spreadsheet. And that row of information gives it a, a time code, a location, a narrative ID, a number, it has the content, but then it has a set of tags and filters that allow us to then query that information for ourselves, but then also for the end product that we were trying to uh, put together for our investigation. And so each one of these uh, data points in one of these rows of information would become a data point on a map that had a spatial temporal component. Um, and that produced about, I think, 5,000 individual points of information. So quite a lot of, in well, actually not quite a lot, a lot of information. And the, the, the sort of the outcome of the project uh, as an object, not in terms of the, what is what, and sort of the, the conceptual outcome, but the but actual product of the, the investigation was the Ayotzinapa platform. And the Ayotzinapa platform was, is essentially a, 
a cartographic tool that uh, plots all these points of information in time and space. It plots also communications. Uh, and so it looks something like this. And it's got, uh, so the map environment, it's got a timeline, so the points appear in both of these, and you can sort of adjust and, and, and explore the events through the map and through time. And then it's got, it had this extensive uh, tag list in which we had, uh, I mean, there were hundreds of tags, but you could search by uh, victims as a general group, but also individual students, police as a general group, but also individuals, but also types of incidents, vehicles, weapons, things like that. The platform also had uh, a set of 3D models, which were the, the reconstructions, digital reconstructions of <clears throat> three of uh, the most important crime scenes of the, of the incident um, that we tried to reconstruct in order to present certain aspects of it in, in our investigation. These, uh, this is uh, another screenshot of the sort of the different crime scenes. These are the usually the places where there were the most amount of casualties, and two of them were the, the scenes where uh, students were uh, forcefully disappeared. And then also we produced these uh, video reports. And the video reports are important because while the platform is extensive, um, the platform is also highly complex uh, and difficult to use. But the video reports uh, became a way uh, to allow people that don't necessarily have uh, the understanding of dealing uh, with a, a multi-layered platform to give them an entry point into the, the investigation, but also to give them the tools to understand the issues that we wanted to talk about. And it's important to say at this point that the platform itself um, doesn't reveal new information, but what the platform does is that it creates new links between uh, existing information, and essentially what it does is it spatializes uh, the act of mass disappearance uh, perpetr as perpetrated by the state and reveals or allows a uh, person who visits the website to, uh, to s visualize and study what uh, a city or a geographical region looks like when it is under siege in this very specific context. I'm going to play you a small excerpt of the video, um, of one of the videos. Uh, so, sorry, I'm just going to say a few things here. This is a video, uh, we created a set of tutorial videos to explain to people how to actually use the platform, but instead of being uh, sort of basic tutorials where we just say click here, click there, we wanted each of the tutorial videos uh, to actually explore an issue. And the reason why I'm showing it to you, it, one, it explains better than I can how the platform works, but it also gives you a, uh, sort of a, a, an in into the type of issues that were being discussed in this investigation and sort of for the rest of my presentation. La plataforma Yotzinapa es una herramienta cartográfica diseñada para visualizar los eventos que tuvieron lugar en Iguala, Guerrero, la noche del 26 y 27 de septiembre de 2014. En este video, demostramos cómo usar la plataforma para explorar el rol que jugó el ejército, para navegar a través de los testimonios dados por los militares, dé clic en la sección Personas y abra la pestaña Por Testimonio. En el grupo Fuerzas de Seguridad, Seleccione la casilla Ejército. Los eventos seleccionados se mostrarán como círculos verdes. En el mapa, podemos ver cómo los eventos relacionados con los militares siguen de cerca las rutas que tomaron los autobuses de los estudiantes, además de la gran cantidad de eventos asociados con la presencia militar en las escenas del crimen más relevantes. En la línea de tiempo, podemos ver cómo el ejército estuvo activo mientras se desarrollaban todos los eventos. Los más altos niveles de actividad también son visibles antes de los ataques, desde la hora en que los estudiantes salieron de la normal de Ayotzinapa, alrededor de las 17.30 horas. Active el botón de comunicaciones para ver las llamadas, reportes y otras comunicaciones entre los miembros del ejército. Claramente emerge un patrón en el que los militares enviaron información directamente de las escenas del crimen al cuartel del Batallón 27. El ejército también usó el sistema centralizado de comunicaciones C4, a través del cual otras agencias de seguridad intercambiaban información sobre el ataque. Vaya a la pestaña Por mención, despliegue el grupo Fuerzas de Seguridad y dé clic sobre Ejército. Esta información 
representa los eventos en los que los militares fueron mencionados por otras personas. Explore estos puntos para encontrar información que los militares omitieron sobre los eventos de esa noche. Para investigar miembros del ejército en particular, deseleccione el grupo actual de Ejército o dé clic al botón de Reset. En la pestaña de Por testimonio, en el grupo Ejército, desplace el cursor hacia abajo y escoja uno de los individuos de la lista. El agente de inteligencia militar OBI-1EM estuvo presente en la escena del Palacio de Justicia durante el ataque en ese lugar. Sus comunicaciones registran que estuvo en constante comunicación con el cuartel del ejército en Iguala, reportando la violencia contra los estudiantes. Encuentre al agente OBI-EM en la sección Por mención para ver dónde más fue mencionado. Finalmente, vaya a la sección Escenas y explore los modelos en 3D para observar cómo fue que los militares estuvieron presentes en los episodios finales de cada una de las escenas del crimen. La plataforma Ayotzinapa revela cómo el ejército monitoreó activamente a los estudiantes antes, durante y después de los ataques. A pesar de estar completamente al tanto de la violencia contra los normalistas y de estar presente durante los ataques, no tomó acción alguna para ayudarlos. To be a, a lag between the the audio and the visual there. Um, so when we when we set out um, to data mine these two reports, um, the the only thing the only certainty that we had was that um, what seemed to be missing in the public debate surrounding the incident was uh, a version of the events that aligned with uh, the one of the victims, uh, either the victims that were there that night or the you know, the families of the victims, so the, the families of um, the students that disappeared that night. Uh, and essentially the, the, the state sort of has uh, the largest megaphone for these things uh, and, and was, has been very uh, successful at promoting its own version of the facts in which uh, this was uh, a freak incident in which a random group of hooligans got attacked by rogue police officers and handed to alleged members of organized crime. Um, And, and so beyond, beyond simply just data mining this report that we felt contained the information uh, to talk about that narrative or that version of the facts, we, we didn't actually have a clear sense of how we were going to present that. And one of the problems when you data mine 5,000 points of information is you end up with an overload of information. And so um, very quickly we started to find ways of actually organizing the data ourselves even without having the actual platform. But the, the techniques that we used in order to do that turned out to be uh, very powerful tools later on in order to uh, reveal certain aspects of the case that we thought were important to talk about, um, but also then present uh, our investigation. So this is, a, this is sort of like the, the first thing that we started off by doing was simply saying, well, there are a certain amount of crime scenes and we're going to start to compartmentalize the event into different aspects, um, different sort of uh, groups, and we're simply going to start plotting them on a timeline. And simply by doing that, we realized that if we, could, we can plot these events in time, then here you look at the timeline of one of the crime scenes, you start to see peaks of activity, and then you can start to say, well, okay, we can start to now break down events into different phases, we can see how different crime scenes actually have very similar phases, we can identify where there's peaks of information, we can identify where there's a peak in communication. Uh, and then we took those, these timelines, and then, you know, this is in a very analog way, then we, we rearranged them, but spatially, so we then rearranged them spatially in the crime scene, And in doing so, we, we realized, well, we, there, we're still really confused by all this information, so we're going to break down minute by minute um, every, everything, essentially, for these crime scenes, and we're going to diagram them and annotate where people are moving, who is actually there. And so here's uh, three examples of those, but those turn into this, which eventually turned into five times this. And those allowed us to do uh, the sort of um, the sequential reconstructions of the scenes. But what was uh, what sort of uh, the first thing that stood out to us when we did these uh, reconstructions was the, the scale of the incident themselves. So if if we go back to the the, the official version, in which there's a few rogue policemen attacking a few uh, rogue hooligans, suddenly we started to realize that well, there's actually one two. You, 
There's 12 uh, police cars here, and that's just in one crime scene. There's also every single level of law enforcement is somehow involved. And I mean, I can list it. There's about 10 different levels of law enforcement that are involved. And so little by little, we started to realize the, the scale of the events and, and the fact that pretty much every branch of law enforcement was somehow active in these violent incidents, either through direct action or through omission. Um, this idea of scale also came out when we started to actually try to keep track of the different uh, actors involved. This is uh, probably like the quarter of a larger drawing that where we tried to actually follow the connections between people, uh, military, students, police, etc. And it gives you sort of a sense of how confusing this event actually gets. And so in total, we logged about 5,000 individual incidents using 266 different tags to describe security forces, logged the known information concerning 93 students, examined 280 different mentions of other actors involved in the case, victims, government officials, experts, medical staff, protected witnesses, etc. 208 different mentions of vehicles, police patrols, civilian vehicles, ambulances, a lot of them are police patrols, and 520 instances of communication between two or more actors. So that, that's at the level of you know, each individual incident, but also we realized when we started to spatialize uh, the, the, these events, uh, we could also start to uh, find patterns of, of escalation in the dimension of the violence through time and space. So if you take Iguala as the epicenter, um, actually the violence became more and more discriminant and there were more and more casualties the further you moved out of the epicenter of Iguala. And sometimes you, when you do an investigation, you, you touch upon points like this, but you don't it's, it's not a point that we can necessarily pursue to the end because we don't necessarily have all the evidence in order to prove that, but you can start to at least acknowledge these points and, and present them and discuss them. What it also revealed was the coordinated nature of the violence uh, in, term, in, in the sense that uh, the, there was, not only were the attacks coordinated in time, but they all were also coordinated in the, in the way they actually took place. Um, and here is an excerpt of a video that we did um, in which we essentially uh, tried to show this idea of scale and escalation of the violence, but also the coordinated nature. And, and what the video is, is, is that it is, a, it is an exhaustive summary of every known act of violence that happened that night leading up to the disappearance of the students. And the reason why uh, that is sort of necessary as a document is that there, there, that document didn't actually exist before. And there was the criticism or a question that we got from a journalist at some point is, why aren't you talking about the Kukula, uh, the Kukula dump? And, and our answer to that is that everything that happens beyond the point which the students were taken in the back of police cars is unknown. Right? But here is a violence that we can actually quantify and not speculate on. Federal patrols were also present at the scene. By now, the bus was surrounded by approximately 12 cars. Using tear gas, the police forcefully removed the students from the bus. Between 12 and 15 students were beaten up and loaded into the back of multiple police vehicles. They were driven south in the direction of Chilpancingo and disappeared. Protected witness testimonies state that up to three of the patrols involved in the attacks on the students were from Huitzuko Municipal Police. According to the first testimony of the Estrella Roja driver, his bus left the Palacio de Justicia and headed towards the Iguala toll booth. In this case, the bus would have driven over the bridge. Starting at about 22.15, back at the Periferico Norte site, Iguala Municipal Police opened fire on the back of the blocked convoy. The attack was primarily directed at the Estrella de Oro 1568, where student FM suffered gunshot wounds. The students on that bus quickly surrendered. They were forced to lie face down on the pavement before police loaded them into the back of six or seven patrol cars, including patrol cars 17, 18, 20, 22, 27 and 28. Between 20 and 30 students were taken from the bus in this way and all but one of them were forcibly disappeared. This was student FM, 
who was wounded. Um, another thing that uh, we realized uh, when we were sort of trying to organize all this data is, is uh, we had trouble uh, sort of describing forced disappearance. And one of the things that we did is uh, we created, um, we, we, in collaboration with a Mexican-American anthropology student, we uh, created a, a, an ontology of terms to, dis to, uh, to describe violence, not generic violence, but violence in, uh, the, in a Mexican context. Um, and, and that came about because we, we identified that uh, the forced disappearance is not a, a punctual event. Uh, it, it's something that, that lasts in time. So, and it's something that can be separated into two phases. The first one is the violence against bodies, so the actual shooting uh, of the buses and the taking of the bodies. But then after that, there is a pro sort of a prolonged phase that extends to this day which is the act of violence against evidence. And we, we realized that if we organized our ontological terms in a certain way, that sort of, uh, that notion of a two-phased violence could be also presented in a timeline. Um, and then the question was, well, how do we, beyond just a uh, tutorial showing, uh, showing this idea of evidence, uh, violence against evidence, how can we actually do it? And, and one of the, 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 the Actually, no, sorry, I'm going to say that a little bit later. Uh, but just to give you an idea of the, the type of violence against evidence that was happening in this case, there was a, a fifth bus that, um, that never got uh, presented by the Mexican authorities. And then the victims uh, that were in that bus said, well, we were in this fifth bus. And, and when they then presented a fifth bus, they presented a bus that had been completely shot up, when in fact that bus had never been shot up. So that gives you... a uh, as, like an idea of sort of the, the many fronts in which violence against evidence was happening. But uh, violence against evidence is, is also is not something that just happens during that event. It's also something that is much more systematic. And this is uh, an example that I think also speaks volumes about that. This are photocopies of uh, a case file uh, by the PGR, so the prosecutor's office. And these are the documents that get presented to a judge. And obviously, if they were photocopied uh, in color, you might be able to see what's on them. But the, the act of uh, photocopying and actually obscuring what is being shown on the case file is, is part of that much larger uh, uh, sort of and systemic violence against evidence removed from the violence against evidence that happened at the site that night. And the, we found two opportunities in order to talk about violence against evidence and that had to do with uh, the fact that uh, the first one is there were a set of cameras that could have seen the events, but that were deemed to be uh, useless by the prosecutor. And, uh, and so the video focuses on if they had actually been there, this is what they would have seen. And what they would have seen is uh, considerable. And then the other one is the idea of obfuscating evidence uh, by, through omission in testimony. And that video focuses on the testimony of a military agent that uh, was present at the site, gives his testimony, but doesn't describe something that was very key and happening only 20 meters away from him. So I'm going to play you a short excerpt from that. Estuvo presente durante el ataque al autobús Estrella de Oro 1531 y la evacuación forzada del autobús Estrella Roja. Fue este mismo agente el que tomó con su teléfono móvil la única evidencia fotográfica disponible de la escena del crimen del Palacio de Justicia. Forensic Architecture usó estas fotografías para reconstruir la escena, localizando las patrullas fotografiadas en un modelo 3D. La colocación de estas patrullas coincide con los testimonios de otros policías, como Alejandro Andrade, quien declaró que estacionó la patrulla 28 diagonalmente. Además, la reconstrucción espacial de la escena fotográfica nos permite situar a la gente militar 120 metros al oeste del puente bajo el cual se atacó al camión estrella de oro 1531. Desde esta ubicación, el agente también tendría visibilidad del autobús estrella roja. That is uh, the, the military agent and his omission of the bus, and the next one is the camera. Uno de los ataques contra los estudiantes de Ayotzinapa ocurrió frente al Palacio de Justicia del Gobierno del Estado de Guerrero. Este ataque fue capturado por las cámaras de seguridad exteriores de ese edificio. 
estas grabaciones no fueron examinadas ni por las autoridades locales ni por las federales que investigaban el caso. El Poder Judicial del Estado de Guerrero decidió destruir los videos, con el argumento de que tuvieron problemas técnicos y que de cualquier manera las imágenes no eran de interés. Retando esa versión, este video localizará el rango de visión de estas cámaras y sugerirá cuáles habrían sido los hechos captados por ellas. Se identificaron seis cámaras que vigilaban la escena del crimen esa noche y fueron colocadas en un modelo en tercera dimensión. Cuatro de estas cámaras son fijas de circuito cerrado, cuya dirección de visión solamente puede ser cambiada manualmente. Dos de ellas son de tipo domo, capaces de rotar entre 280 y 360 grados. Dos de estas cámaras pudieron haber ofrecido imágenes importantes sobre los ataques contra los estudiantes del autobús Estrella de Oro 1531. Para establecer qué fue lo que pudieron ver estas cámaras, se simuló su rango de visión de acuerdo con las especificaciones de la compañía que las produce. Cámara 5. Una cámara fija de circuito cerrado está localizada en la fachada frontal del edificio. La cámara 5 pudo haber visto lo siguiente. La primera agresión contra el autobús Estrella de Oro 1531, perpetrado por tres patrullas y la posterior acumulación de otras fuerzas de seguridad en el lugar. Una segunda agresión contra ese mismo autobús por parte de tres patrullas de la Policía Municipal de Huitzuco. ¿Y cómo fue que los estudiantes fueron sacados del autobús? y luego subidos a la parte trasera de las patrullas de Huitzuco. La cámara 6, una cámara de tipo domo, localizada en la parte superior de la esquina sureste del edificio, pudo haber filmado. Los vehículos involucrados en los dos ataques contra el autobús Estrella de Oro 1531, la llegada de las tres patrullas de la policía de Huitzuco, y la dirección que tomaron para llevarse a los estudiantes del lugar. La cámara 6, también pudo haber filmado la llegada a la escena del autobús Estrella Roja 3278. Por lo tanto, las imágenes hubieran sido cruciales para verificar en qué dirección o direcciones fueron llevados los estudiantes desaparecidos. Y luego, uno de los tools que se became muy really importante para este proyecto uh, arise from a, a very simple problem. Um, and we call this the sort of the, the narrative matrix. Um, at some point we decided that we were gonna only look at, uh, separate out all the testimonies by alleged members of organized crime. So that is what we would colloquially call cartels uh, in this part of the world, but it's a little bit more complicated over there. Um, and, and the problem that we were facing with the, the alleged members of organized crime was that um, a lot of their testimonies didn't make sense, but more specifically they didn't make sense because often they would they wouldn't say i was here and then i went there and then i went here they would say i was not there i was somewhere else uh, so they would be constantly mentioning themselves but denying that they were in the place of interest and so we came up with this very simple device to actually start plotting them uh, and so what you see is uh, horizontally you have time and vertically you have space So these are just locations. So this is an example of one line that we've plotted. And where you can see the solid line is where he places himself in a given time. But then the dotted line and the other points is where other people place this person at that time. And so you can see there's quite a lot of deviation between what he claims and what other people claim. So we plotted one, and then we plotted two. And the thing is that there are three different uh, overarching narratives coming from members of, of or criminal organizations. So this is uh, the first set of narratives, and these are the narratives of all the people involved in that one. This is the narrative of another person. And this is the narrative of, uh, for, or another narrative. And uh, what you see here, we, we sort of realize that what, what you see in this image that is hyper confusing is essentially a, a sort of the revelation or the, 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 the revealing of one aspect of forced disappearance, which is um, the clouding of facts through uh, false narratives or false positives and uh, what are they called? False positives and false negatives. Um, and essentially, the, the, this cloud of information that you see here is uh, symptomatic of what forced disappearance is. And that, that is that if, if their testimonies and their narratives uh, stood any ground, 
they would all be starting in different geographical locations, but they would all converge into one point. But what we see here is a cloud of, of confusing information, and that confusing information is in random. Um, and, and then we, we, once we, we sort of developed this a little bit further, this sort of uh, narrative uh, complex, we actually tried to implement it into the platform as something that could be spatialized. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't used because it was, we thought it was too confusing to, uh, if you draw lines on a map with dots and, and uh, an arrow, people associated with trajectory, or so where people travel to, and, and it's a bit more complicated than that because these are narratives. It's not necessarily where people were, but where people claim they were. But this is a, a screenshot of a test that we did at some point where we plotted everybody's narrative, um, students, police, uh, uh, criminal organizations. And what's really interesting about plotting narratives is that once they're spatialized, they can actually reveal something about the, about the incident. And what you see here is a triangle where there seems to be a lot happening. And it's, it's also the triangle in which uh, there's all the state institutions, and this, this is the triangle in which uh, the violence was committed against the students. But the actual, uh, uh, the actual uh, alleged killing and burning of the bodies happens somewhere in this area. It happens outside of town, uh, sorry, in the west, in the east side of town. So the, the violence happened in the west side of town, but the actual act of killing happens in the, the west side of town. And, and what we realized then is that if you actually look at the narratives of uh, the perpetrators, there is only one single point in which uh, the, we have a testimony that actually transposes that act of killing from the western side to the eastern side of town. And so there's a, there's a spatialization or there's, there's a, a spatial projection of the violence that is happening uh, that can be actually mapped. It might be a little bit complicated to understand, but it's something that can actually be revealed by processing information in a certain way. But uh, this, this actual act of, of plotting narratives then became a central tool in the project to sort of present, uh, present this aspect of the, the presentation. Um, and I don't want to give too much, but it, essentially we, we did an exercise where in, with the same type of diagram, we plotted uh, the government version of the events, the student version or the, the victim's version of the events, and then the alleged members of organized crime version of the events. And what we found out, what we realized, and it became super clear in the, in the diagram anyway, is that the, the official version of the events deviates from that of the victims, which is already highly problematic. But not only that, it converges towards uh, the version of members of organized crime, but more specifically, it converges towards the narratives of members of organized crime who might have been tortured uh, while in police custody. So that means that the, the, the version on which the government relies is uh, deeply flawed and void because essentially, well, not essentially, it allegedly might be uh, relying on testimony that has been tampered with through torture. And um, this was sort of our, our way of presenting um, this, this idea and this information uh, to the public within the context of our, our, our platform as a way of better understanding the, the issues behind the event. With a black line, we drew the versions of the events as officially presented by the Attorney General of Mexico, the Procurador General de la República, or PGR, which he called the historic truth. This version is still the one presented before the Mexican judges in the ongoing case. According to the PGR's so-called historic truth, at 1300 hours, the students were already at the outskirts of Iguala, in Casata de Iguala and Rancho del Cura, trying to commandeer buses. Between 1900 and 2000 hours, they regrouped at the Iguala bus terminal. At 2045, as they were leaving the terminal, they were attacked by the Iguala local police. The students proceeded to drive to the junction of Juan Alvarez Street with Periférico Norte when they were attacked again. 20 to 25 students were then taken to Comandancia Police Station. From there they were taken to Loma de Coyote and finally to the Cocula Dump where they were executed by members of criminal organisations, their bodies left burning until midday the following day. In red, we drew the paths of the victims, who were students, and a local football team, Los Avispones, according to their testimonies.
At 17.30, roughly four and a half hours later than the time determined by the PGR, the students left the Ayotzinapa school towards Iguala. At the Iguala bus terminal, they commandeered three more buses and left the station in two convoys. Both convoys were attacked simultaneously in two separate locations, one at the northern end of Juan Alvarez Street and one in front of the regional courthouse, the Palacio de Justicia. Two further attacks occurred later that night. Many of these attacks were not acknowledged in the PGR's account. Here, an important discrepancy between the narratives becomes visible. The PGR claimed that the students had already been taken from the buses at the time when the students testified they were still under attack. This is the moment when the students were forcibly disappeared. The surviving students then dispersed, some trying to escape. In purple, we drew the narrative paths of the alleged members of criminal organisations according to their testimony. Nine such narratives are drawn on the mural. Together they show three different scenarios relating to the fate of the 43 students. We blurred the lines representing statements taken in police custody, which, according to the independent group of experts, may have been obtained under torture. The proximity of the purple and black lines demonstrates that the official PGR scenario, claiming the bodies were burnt in the Gokula dump, is derived from the testimony of criminals obtained through torture. The distance of the purple and black lines from the red line shows how these accounts diverge from the victim's own narratives. And so this, this method of drawing, this uh, method of, of showing narrative in, in time and space then became the basis of uh, this, uh, our large mural piece which we exhibited at the MOAC. And the mural piece sort of became a, a, an object of, of discussion where we, we got students from the university involved to actually uh, sort of learn about the mural but also discuss it with uh, the investigative journalists that uh, helped us out through the project. Um, and it became a very powerful tool to actually present sort of uh, the entirety of the case through one single drawing. Um, and I, I think like as a, as a conclusion point um, here is, is that, um, you know, there, there is, violence has a spatial dimension um, and, and, uh, and, and often it's not about, you know, revealing um, brand new information. A lot of information is already embedded within documents that are just are not s uh, spatial in their in their format and actually unpacking them and being able to sort of lay them out in time and space can be something that is uh, an exercise that actually reveals a lot more and helps to uh, to sort of uh, change the public discourse around an incident. Um, and it is something that I guess should be pursued as well. Thank you very much.